midst of us, Lord. And we thank you for that. God, we thank you for the trials of our lives, Lord God, that bring us into deeper joy. Lord, that, that lead us in, into deeper understandings of, the, of your attributes, Lord, of who you are. And thank you for these things, God. And I ask God tonight that you would be with Troy Beaver and Miss Montoya, Lord, Mrs. Montoya. Touch her heart, Lord, and give her peace. Lord, ease the pain, take it away. Whatever you want to do with Troy, God, if it's there for a reason, Lord, that he's sitting out for a time for a purpose that's yours, God, may he find out what it is. Lord, be with all of us tonight and help us to leave here different. And God, give us courage. Give us courage because things in this world are out of hand. Lord, make sure that we know Make sure that we know that we need you so that we can have more of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Peter 4. Now, I'm going to do a lot of scripture here. But, uh, John got three over three hours last Sunday, so I, that means I can. Okay. <laughs> strange. 412. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Everybody has heard this scripture. I'm sure of it. But we're going to hear it again. So, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Praise God. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, listen, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glory, glorify God in this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must begin in the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's a very radical verse. If the righteous are scarcely saved, what is that saying by the skin of their teeth? In, the, in a sense it is because God is holy. But he's also merciful, which is part of holiness. Because mercy is a God thing and God is holy, so that means he's set apart. So that is a holy thing. Mercy is a holy thing. Yeah. I need some more. <laughs> well, he tells us how to get it, to be merciful. He tells us where to go, and, and the whole thing here, he, in this book, he shows us how, what, when, why. He, he shows us what everything, but that verse always really, really put something in me. If, this, if the righteous be scarcely saved, what's that say for the ungodly? So what, it, what it's telling me is, is, let's use this discernment, let's use this gift, let's use this Holy Spirit to make sure that we are where we need to be in the Lord. And that's that's what he's telling me. But 19, wherefore let them that suffer according to the what? Will of God. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. He says those that suffer in the will of God. So tonight... We're not really talking about suffering. You know, the old life that I lived, I suffered, man. Jeez. Man. 
and sometimes, and still, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll disobey God, and I'll get into a tangle up, you know what I mean? And I'm suffering. It's an affliction. But it's not a sanctified affliction. It's something that happened. I'm reaping something that I have sown. And so God's allowing me to go through it. Now, it doesn't mean that he won't show up in it and make good out of evil or out of bad. He, he will. But what he's talking about is suffering with Christ, is suffering righteously. Not just suffering because of something we did wrong. See, there's consequence in everything. He's talking about suffering by being obedient. Suffering with Christ is a privilege, I'm learning. You know, because I think of some of the stories that I've heard uh, of suffering. I have a brother that's sitting in here tonight. I won't point him out, but I know that he suffered more than almost anybody I know. But I think of stories, and then I think of myself when my, my wife asked me to empty the trash. And it's like the trial of my life. <laughs> <laughs> So if the righteous are scarcely saved, no. <laughs> but I'm serious. I think of the things that, I'm, I'm this type of guy. I am bipolar. That's what they call it. No. It used to be manic depression. I'm a real black and white kind of guy. Now, I feel like this, and I've told, I think Pastor Chuck, I've told this, when bombs start dropping and all this insanity starts happening, I'll probably be able to quit taking my lithium. <laughs> it's the gray area where I struggle. Man, you know what I'm saying? I think it's, an, I think it's true, though, with all of us. I mean, you think of the, the first century church. I got a lady that says, we got to get to the first, be like that. And I'm like, oh. they, they were running for their lives. They didn't know where they were, you know, come on. Right. When there is that kind of pressure, I believe that it is easier to be bolder for Jesus. And oh, yeah. what's happening is that's what's going on. Yep. And God's getting us ready through pressure uh, to, to bring us to a place where we are bolder for Jesus. Right. Where we finally get beside ourselves, where, where the world is crucified, okay, and we are done, and we have nothing in our way, nothing to stop us. From nothing, no reason to be ashamed for our suffering through persecution, through through whatever it is. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's in the name of Jesus that this is what's happening, it's going to be so much easier for us to be evangelists, preachers, teachers, to talk about Jesus because of the, what is going on in this world. Yes. I believe it. I believe the, the, the gray zone is confusing. But when it starts getting evident and clear of what, what's happening, it becomes uh, easier, easier clearer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do what you gotta do. Yeah. I am ready for whatever. I'm ready to quit taking the lithium. It gives me cotton now. Dry mouth. <laughs> Don't think it's strange considering the fiery trial. That's like a trial that's like lightning. Something that comes sudden, bam, in your life. Don't think it's strange. Man, Peter makes it sound so easy. Beloved, don't, don't think of it as a strange thing. One of these fiery trials come and they try you as though some strange thing happened to you. He says, rejoice. Rejoice. Yeah. Ask yourself, am I rejoicing when all hell breaks loose on me? Or even in the menial things, you know, I have to work. I'm not a full-time preacher, guy. Okay? Sometimes I have to show up at the furnace and work clothes. You go, oh God. Last night was really funny. They scheduled us to, to the furnace, and um, 
turns out there's a big group too, and here's all the cops in there. They got pizza and they set up their headquarters in, in uh, our place. So then everybody starts rolling in. I'm like, oh, there's cops sitting there visiting with their wives and CVs going off and everything. And I'm like, okay. So we were going to move it. We tried to move it to this park. And then you got a family and they're having a party, they're barbecuing. And so, you know, a good turnout. My feelings got hurt. I said, let's go. I couldn't handle it. I'm like, see, I, I can't handle this. I just, listen, everybody's fine. No one's dying. Nobody's overdosing nothing. Everybody's fine. They're in the Lord. Let's go. Let's cut it off. I'm going home. <laughs> then I tried to say, hey, come up to my house, and nobody came. <laughs> but it's the menial things. Man, th maybe this way I'm talking to me. God, help me to rejoice in all things. Amen. You go back to, to, to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll just get through this real quick. And King James, blessed be the God and Father, verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3, blessed be the Father, I'll admit I'm out of season, I don't care, I'm still here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant, what, mercy, mercy. have begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Who are kept by the power of God. I cannot believe, last night when I went down in that vortex of humanity with souls all around me and spirits and everything else, I didn't try to name them or claim them. I just know there's good, there's evil. I'm walking in the Holy Spirit. God, you got my back. You, you're going before me, you're behind me, you got me. This is cool. I thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, when I first got saved, I'd be like, oh, no, we shouldn't go down there. <laughs> because, you know, that's what I thought. But if I would have went down there, I wouldn't have, that kid couldn't hug me. He needed to hug somebody. Yep. But we're kept by the power of God. This is so important because your girlfriend or your wife or your husband or your, or your job, or nothing keeps you but the power of God. I, I realize that if you, what are you putting your faith in? What are you standing on? What am I standing on? What are we standing on? Because when a fiery trial comes yes, and something's amen. ripped out of your life, are you going to be able to rejoice and realize that you're suffering with Christ? <laughs> but Jesus lost his whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't. But he did Jesus Christ didn't have a, didn't know where to lay his head. Jesus Christ was betrayed by you and me. Not just Judas. Everybody gets down on Judas. <clears throat> what about me? What about you? I don't know. We're Judases. Uh, we've been Judases. We've been the same way. We've been Peters. We've been all these things. But Jesus Christ is powerful. Because I was thinking last night when I was going through the crowds, it's like a maze, and I was thinking to myself, my God, how much sin have you kept me from in these 11 years? Yes. That's right. Not that I have not sinned, mm. but what have you kept me from? Yeah. And, and sometimes we get in a place where we, we take it for granted, where we start not even thinking about the things that God is keeping us from, right. the people that he's keeping out of our lives. All these things. What has God kept you from in this day to day? In the last 12 hours, what has God kept you from? Oh my God, help us, Jesus. We don't even know anymore because sometimes we're getting so self-righteous that we don't realize where we came from. That's what happens to me. And I forget, oh my God. You could have kept me from shooting dope today. You could have kept me from sleeping with whatever, whoever today. You could have kept me from killing somebody mm -hmm. in this last ten and a half years. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Yes. We are kept by the power of God through faith. You're not kept by good looks, by your charisma, by your charm, 
by the, this power we think we might have, or anything else, any kind of idolatry. There's nothing in this world that's keeping you. It's, there's nothing in this world that gives you the next breath. We all know this. It's God. But let's give him praise tonight and say thank you, Lord, for keeping me. Maybe you went out on God. Maybe you slid back. I don't know. Maybe something happened. But still in the midst of that, even though it's tragic and whatever, and the feelings that come and all the filth that comes with sliding away from God and turning your back on Him, He still kept you through it. Amen. Amen. Man. Amen. I love God. So we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Listen to this. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. I love this. I like the King James Version better than this one. For a season, if need be, God knows what we need. So now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. That means many temptations come in all different directions, basically. Imagine. But I want to tell you something. It's, this is not. This is. This is somebody walking the very in faith, in obedience. It's not going on. This is somebody that's doing the best that they can to walk in the light that God has given them. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, if need be, God knows. He knows what we need. He just allows something. And it's for the greater of the good. It's not God punishing you. It's not life punishing you. It's just reality. It is life on earth for a saint serving an infinite God. And God is doing this for a purpose. Though if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, now King James says it that way. <clears throat> Other ones say uh, faith. I like this, though, if this is the way it is. If it's not, oh well, but I like it. The trial of your faith. That the trial of your faith being more, much more precious than gold that perish. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. How often do we talk about Whatever event that's tribulation, uh, pressure, something hellacious, something hard, something that burns, something fiery, how often do we say, man, this is more precious than gold. I love it. I just, this is more precious than gold. This trial that I'm in, brother, sister, is more precious than gold. That's what Peter is telling us to do. He says, rejoice. Oh my God, help me. I'm starting to wonder if I'm scarcely saved, saved, whatever, ungodly. I, I think I know what I am. But you know what I mean? When, when greatly rejoice, 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 rejoice. I've been hearing that in my head. Rejoice, rejoice. Re I'm like a rapper of Eminem. <laughs> rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, what do you mean? Maybe you're starting to drift off, or maybe you're getting self-righteous, or maybe something stupid's going on, and God needs to put something in you. That's right, amen. God needs to test you. Tests are made to pass. God allows something to come into your life so that He can demonstrate His keeping power in your life so that you can praise His holy name and glorify Him. That's what He's doing. So don't think it's strange. Think about it. This is how it works. This is what's going on. This is what I'm meant to be in right now. It could be the most horrific thing. Sudden tragedy hits. It doesn't mean that we can't cry and break down. And God will even put up with some anger. But it means that we know to whom we belong. And we know that he's allowing this. He, he's in control. He's sovereign. I'm not. And he is wanting and desiring to use this to perfect his will in our lives. To glorify his own name in us. So let's not think it's strange. <laughs> it's easy to preach. It really is. No, we'll see what happens when we go home. <laughs> no, not you. But... 
I'm trying to get through this. Okay, is it okay if I do? I'm, I, I mean, I don't. I'm a, I, pre, I take a long time. No, you did. No, you did. That's because I'm, I'm not eloquent. You did. And I'm not like Chuck who can wind it so tight. And I'm gonna get that way one day. I'll go in. <laughs> <coughs> start saying it. This trial that I am in, the Word of God says it's more precious than gold, so I need to bear witness with the Word of God and agree with that. Right. Even if I'm not feeling it, I can agree and say, this is more precious than gold. Yep. Oh. Because that's what we get. <laughs> that's what God wants us to get. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. If, listen, God wants us to get to a place where we can handle anything in this life Amen. because we know to whom we belong. Amen. And we know that his Amen. keeping power is at work in us unto salvation. See, the ultimate goal, the ultimate thing is to be with him for eternity. Amen. I heard Pastor Chuck say it right here. We're going to live with him forever. And not only that, but to be conformed into his image through the trial. Yes. What better thing is there than a God-given trial? Not the trials that we're used to in the old the ways that we put on ourselves through sin. I'm talking about trials that just come out of the blue. You're walking, you're high on Jesus, you're singing I'll Fly Away, whatever song you want to sing, it doesn't really matter. It can be secular, it doesn't matter, you're loving God. And then the next thing you know, all hell breaks loose. And then examine yourselves. We're supposed to rejoice. Why? Because we have to have an eternal vision. We have to realize what this really is about. People are going to die. Things are going to happen. People are gonna go into hell. Oh God, it breaks your heart. It just shakes you to the core. But what are you gonna do? You're gonna rejoice. You're gonna rejoice. You're gonna say, Oh God, all that you've kept me from. Why? You can say, Why me? If you want. We say it when we're in, when we're in the trial. Why are you? Well, why not you? Why not say, why me, God, instead of, why me, like as a victim or whatever? How about, why did you choose me? The runt of the litter, the weak and the foolish person, whatever it is. Why me? Why did you choose me? The one that hurt people. The one that was, that practiced such evil. Why me? How about that way? Let's switch it around with a little reverse psychology on the enemy and say, why me, Jesus? I'm in this thing, I'm rejoicing, it hurts, it's burning, it's fiery, I hate it. I can tell you honestly, God, I don't dig it at all. But what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to produce in me? Reveal to me, oh God, that I not drag this child out longer than you have made it to be. God! That's good, amen. Squeeze out the honey. You know, NLT? going to talk about those guys. Uh, this is going a different way, but that's fine. Um, than I planned, I guess. Um, Daniel. I know we all know the story. I'm going to try to break this down in a way that God's been showing me that's maybe personal, but we're all the same body here. I'm not used to this little bite over here. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Don't you hate when you're so used to a Bible that you can't even function? <laughs> you're not even looking, you know, because you're not worth damn up there. 
I mean, you're not even looking at the names. You, you, the Bible you're used to, it's like, you know? <laughs> I had to use hers once with my wife, that is. When I preached her, oh, man, that was hard. It's always hard anyway for me when, when I'm trying to teach something. Okay. Someone help me. Where's Daniel? There it is. I saw so much degradation. I've seen so much, but I haven't been around. I've been in places, but last night for some reason I said, God, show me something, man. Well, I'm here. And I saw people being drugged around in trials that God never wanted them to be in. Unsanctified. Because of sin and self, mostly self. But yeah, the devil, he, he, he's the god of this age, this world, right? One thing for sure, if you're saved, if you're born again, Satan, the only thing he has is a lying spirit. Right. The only thing the devil has in the kingdom of God, if you've been translated, is a spirit to lie to you. Yes. Because he, keep, he, he gets to keep his nature. But he does not have any weapon formed against you. There is nothing. Because Jesus Christ, what a glorious thing when you came to the cross and you cried out, Jesus, save me. Jesus, come into my life. God, come into my life. And he came in as a mighty Savior, a strong man. And he confiscated everything the devil had. He cast him out of your life. Amen. The only thing he has is a lying spirit. Yes. And it's up to you through discernment to choose what you want to believe. Right. He cannot hurt you. He cannot... The only thing he can do is go, boom! And you might even jump. <laughs> but then you, you're soon. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shadow has never hurt me in my life. I don't know about you. A shadow of a snake has never bitten me. A shadow of a gun has never shot me. I walk in the shadow. The, the shadow of death. I, once upon a time, I walked in death because I was dead in sins and transgressions. But God, glory be to God, He quickened me by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm alive. And now I walk through the shadow of death. And we all know what makes a shadow. The sun? Does that make sense? Yes. Amen. Perfect sense. Satan, I see more demons cast out of people or tents or whatever you want, I don't know, in churches than I do on the street. There's something wrong there to me. If anybody wants to cast out a devil, fib art's going on. And if you are prayed up, powered up, ready up, whatever up, seven up, go up, go down there and get them. Because I'll guarantee you there's many of them, legions of them. So let's get real. Do you want to cast something out? I'm not, I'm just saying, go down there and glorify God. Do you want to give a word to somebody? Go down there and glorify God tonight. Pray to God that he would give you a word of knowledge for some soul, if it may be, if that's what God wants to do. And trust him and see if it happens. He, if nothing might not happen. You might get a hug from an 18-year-old kid who's drunk. But you can tell him, I love you, brother, and God loves you. I don't know, I'm just saying. Isn't there a world to, to be evangelized? Isn't, aren't we, isn't the Great Commission to go out there and seek yeah. those? Yeah. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Not just people, but the whole thing. The whole divine order. <laughs> Demons even have a new relationship with Christ ever since the cross. Yeah. That's right. It's changed. He changed everything. And he's bringing his kids home. Now listen, God wants us, more than going and casting devils right now in this, is to be able to come to a place where we can bear witness with the Holy Word of God and whatever's going on in our hearts, in our lives. Let's start there, maybe at least till tomorrow, and start rejoicing when you can't find the remote to the TV. Or, or, or you stub your toe, or whatever it is. When you go to Walmart.
Walmart and you have to park way out in the back. Let's start rejoicing and let's start thinking of someone like the Apostle Paul who walked how many miles to reach the lost. Let's start with the menial, simple, grace areas and say, God, let, help me to be faithful in this little trial here. God, help me to be faithful next time Lisa asks me to take out the trash just because it's overflowing. <laughs> Instead of, uh, God, I want to be like Elijah. Elijah ran from a woman. <laughs> Sorry, Elijah. <laughs> I've done it too. No, I'm just saying, what about these little, what about these trials? I'm repeating myself because I want to burn in your head until you can't stand it. Hey, rejoice. Something's coming. Ready or not, here I come. And it's not the devil, it's God. God's saying, ready or not, child, here I come. I may use the devil to see where you're really at. What do you believe about this Satan? I believe that Jesus Christ stripped him of his power at the cross. Praise God. Now, do I believe that he's real? Yes. And I believe that he has power and he rules supreme in his kingdom. But not mine. Not the kingdom of God. Not where I stand. He does not rule. He has no authority. He has no power. Can he attack me? You better believe it because he does all the time. But I know one thing, that he cannot touch me. He cannot hurt me. He cannot kill me. And it's up to me to believe him or my God. Right. It's been the armor. It's good. It's good. It's been the armor. We need to get Satan and all this glorified Satan stuff out. We need to glorify Jesus. If I be high and lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. To myself, he says. But you, it's our job to clean house. It's our job to live right. It's our job to rejoice. Not just when it's good and we're singing when it's bad and we can hardly even say it, but in our heart we, get, we squeeze it out. We say, thank you, Jesus. You don't think Jesus was saying, thank you, Father. When his, who knows what, how he felt, when he was beaten, when he was demolished, I'm sure in his heart and in, his, in the blood and everything, why? Because he knew that he was pleasing the Father. The joy that was set before him yes. primarily was pleasing the Father. We are secondary to that. I guarantee it. The joy, for the joy that was set before him, else, that's me. No, that's because he was pleasing the Father. He wrestled in the garden with Father. He didn't want to go through with it, but he submitted, and that's when, oh my God, the angel came. He strengthened him to, so that he could endure what was, he had to go through with. It was an act of obedience. Jesus Christ himself wrestling with God. I'm sure that once he prayed through in that garden and submitted and came into agreement with Father God and he was strengthened to pray on through, I'm sure that he, after that minute, he was rejoicing. Why? Because he knew the mandate that was set before him. He knew it anyway, but he had a hesitation because of his flesh. Things were happening inside him that we can't possibly imagine. Things, forces, raiding against our Jesus Christ. Things inside of him, vulnerabilities, fears, all kinds of things, just like you and me. But after he came into agreement with what? With the Father. After we come into agreement with what? The Word of God through the Holy Spirit. It's only then that we can rejoice in spirit and in truth. We can say, I rejoice, praise God, I rejoice, praise God, all we want. But if we're not coming under submission to his word, then our rejoicing is in vain. That's right. I'm not trying to hurt anybody, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you what God tells me, because that's what he, he's doing. And he's been telling me. Three, uh, Daniel 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 90 feet wide. Wow. That's a big one. And set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. I wanted to go through all the history and stuff, and the captivity in Daniel. But you guys have a Bible, so that's good. Um, 
the province of Babylon. Then he said, I would like to get together some night and uh, I may not go to Manic. Um, what was I saying? Oh, get some Red Bulls and make 10, 10 pots of coffee. And wouldn't it be fun? I mean, really, they do it out there. Red Bulls, that's all right. Or whatever, monster. Whatever you want, pick so your poison. So See, that's what the devil is about. Pick your poison. So be. But no, it, wouldn't that be cool and have a slumber party? Even though we don't sleep? And we sit around and read the book of Daniel? There's a lot of yes. good stuff in Daniel. And, and, or whatever book you want? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be fun? I think it would. Maybe we'll try it. I ain't buying the Red Bull, though. I'll bring coffee. <laughs> So he sets this statue up on the plain of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now this Nebuchadnezzar was an entrepreneur. I mean, he was good. He was building, I mean, right? You should have seen, I can imagine, Babylon, different cultures, kind of like America, a lot of like slide exit, we don't have quite the structures that he had, but a lot of things, weird stuff, suits there, you know, astronomer, I mean, you know, all these different things going on, and, but this guy was a pretty smart guy, but he was an idiot. I know the Bible says not to call anybody, but I think, I mean, he was... He was stupid. He, I mean, the guy was nuts. Read about him. He's just, he, God ends up, he ends up eating grass 